A large chunk of the work that I create never sees the light of day, especially not on this channel. That means that over the years I've came up with lots of different tips and tricks that I've never actually shown off on Decoded. So I thought today I would just sit down and talk about four or five of my favourite little techniques that I use all the time to get better results in Blender. One problem that I constantly run into is the camera running out of the bounds of the scene and going behind a wall or an object getting in the way of the camera when I'm trying to frame a shot. Here's a good example of what I'm talking about. I have a room here with this monkey head and a mirror just behind it. If we take a look through the camera, the monkey head doesn't quite fit into the shot, but if I try to move the camera backwards a little bit, it goes through this wall, which gets in the way. It would be nice if we could have a way to basically make objects disappear if they get too close to the camera. And that's actually fairly easy to do. All I'm going to do is select this wall and I'm going to go to the material, which at the moment is just a principal shader. I'm going to add a mix shader to this and I'm going to mix it with the transparent shader. Then I'm going to use a node that we don't use very often in Blender a lot of the time, which is the camera data node. It has this output here called view distance and I'm just going to plug that in as the mix factor. Now that won't do a lot for us right now. One thing I need to do is add a math node and I'm just going to divide this output by 100 make it a bit more reasonable. And now you can see that the walls are actually getting more transparent the further they are away from the camera. Okay, you won't be able to see it like this, but if we move into the camera view, you can see that the walls, the transparency changes depending on the distance to the camera. So what I'm gonna do now is add in a color ramp and I'm gonna set this to constant And then I'm going to move the camera so it goes behind the bounds and I'm going to swap these labels over. And if we just move this into place, what you can see here is that the camera can now move around freely. And I don't have to worry anymore about where the walls are going to be. Now one problem that you might have predicted we're going to have with this is that you can see it in the reflections. You can see the wall is appearing and disappearing there, which obviously isn't very good, but that's actually very easy to fix as well. All I'm going to do is get the light path node and I'm going to copy this mix shader. I'm going to put the original shader into the other slot and I'm going to get is camera ray and plug that into here. Uh, I think I actually need to swap the inputs on these. Like this there we go so now you can see the wall is still visible in the reflection but it isn't visible in the camera so now we can set up the shot we can move the camera wherever we want and we don't have to worry about the wall now the cool thing about this is we can grab all of these nodes and press ctrl and g and turn them into their own group and then we can apply this node group to anything we want so if we want the same effect to happen to monkey head itself for instance we can just look for the group we just made, which is node group two. And you can see here, we have the same effect. When the camera gets too close, that disappears. One place I find this really handy, if you have something like this in the scene where you have a card and you have a, like a smoke element or fire or something on it, what happens normally when you fly through something like this with a camera, all of a sudden the smoke just disappears. But if you use a shader setup, like I've just shown you, what you can actually have is the smoke disappear as the camera gets closer. So this is a really handy technique. I use this all the time. If you've ever tried to use a particle system for something like sparks or lasers, you might have noticed before that they don't tend to look that realistic and they kind of look flat and boring and very repetitive. I have just a plane here set up to eject some basic sparks and it doesn't look that great. The physics look pretty good, but the actual material itself doesn't. And the reason for that is because sparks in real life are basically just tiny white hot pieces of metal. But because they're so small, they cool down really quickly, which means they change intensity and they change color. There is actually a node that we can use to do this. It's called the particle info node. And it has a lot of really useful outputs. And the one I like to use for this is age, which basically can change the material of a particle based on how long it's been since it was emitted. So we can just plug that into a math node and I'm going to divide this by oh, 9, 9.5, something like that. It's usually around 9 or 10 where you need to divide it by. I already have a color ramp set up here with some colors that I like. 
We're going to plug this into the color ramp. And I'm going to put this into the color. And if we take a look at this now, what we'll see is that at first, when they are ejected, they are white hot, and then they turn orange, and then eventually dark red and black, and they fade out in a much more natural way. What you can also do is you can take this same output and put it through another color ramp, and you can use this to change the strength over time. So for this first color here, the value, I'm going to give this a value of, let's say, 30, and the second one, I'll just leave at one. I'm going to plug this into the strength. That means they're going to come out brighter at the start. They're going to have a value of 30 for the brightness. And by the end of the life, they're going to only have a value of one. Before we move on to the next tip, I want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is a platform that delivers, in my opinion, some of the best learning content on the internet. They have a really diverse range of topics on there, everything from drawing and video editing to cooking and knitting. And of course, there's plenty of Blender content on there too. It's all delivered by teachers who are professionals in their field and are really passionate and skilled in what they do. Skillshare has curated class structures called learning paths designed to help you build a skill set in a specific area. One learning path to look out for is build 3D models and animations with Blender by Derek Elliott. Derek is a great guy and a talented 3D artist with a real knack for teaching. In the description of this video, you'll find a link to Skillshare and the first 500 people to use that link will get a month of Skillshare absolutely free. If you use a lot of photogrammetry scans like I do, or you just use a lot of photographs as textures, you probably came across this problem before where there's a weird hue to the image. Usually it's caused by the white balance on the camera not being calibrated properly, or sometimes there's just a strange lighting situation and you end up with a model that has a unusual hue to it. Now, normally what I would do to fix that is I would take every single image into an app like Photoshop and manually correct the white balance. And sometimes you have to go back and forth several times between Photoshop and Blender to get it right. That's especially annoying if you have a photo scan that's made up of maybe a dozen different textures, which happens quite often. But there is a way that you can do it in Blender and it makes things so much easier. So speaking of projects that I've never uploaded on this channel, I made an animation a while back called The Alchemist, which never saw the light of day. And I used this really awesome scan of a castle in the opening shot. But one of the problems is because of the lighting conditions when the scan was made, you can see that all of the areas that should be white or gray kind of have this purple hue to them. The grass and everything just looks a little bit sort of pinky purple. So I want to be able to fix that and we can do this really easily just by going into the shader editor and adding in a mix color node, dropping that in between the texture and the principal shader. I'm going to set this to divide, it should be down here. Then for the color, I'm going to set the value to one and I'm just going to try and figure out what the color is I want to get rid of. So in this case, everything looks a little bit sort of pinky purple. I'm just going to drag this across there a little bit and you can see the purple shade has now been removed from the texture. What you can sometimes do, if you have an area of the mesh that uh, should be white, should be exactly white, you can just use the eyedropper. And if you just drop it on that area, you can select the exact color you're trying to get rid of. But in this case, I'm just gonna do it by eye. This is the way I normally do it. If you have a mesh like this and it has lots of different textures, instead of having to export every single one of them to Photoshop, all you would have to do is just copy this node with Ctrl and C, and then paste it into every single material that makes up this mesh, and it would add the same correction to every single material. One of the problems that we have in 3D is trying to get rid of the fact that uh, CGI programs like Blender are inherently perfect. What I mean by that is the, um, the environments all by default look very clean, so we add things like dust and scratches, and we add all of these other effects to try and make things look like that we're filmed with a real camera. Now, one problem that we have is that uh, Blender's camera by default doesn't work like a real camera. If I draw a line here up this, um, I think it's something that you attach like a bike to, a bike hoop, I'm gonna call it. If I draw a line up here, you can see this is perfectly straight up and down, and I can put it next to this little wall here and it lines up absolutely perfectly and I can do that across here too and everything lines up but in real life that's not how cameras work because lenses are obviously curved which means that lines instead of being straight like this are very slightly curved now obviously that's very exaggerated 
But if you've used something like a GoPro before, you'll be aware of the sort of effect that you get when the lens is very obvious. So we can actually do this really easily in Blender. Uh, by default, the type of lens on a camera is set to perspective. We can change this to orthographic, which basically just removes perspective entirely and it looks very weird. But we also have this mode, which is panoramic. And this gives us what looks basically like a fisheye GoPro sort of lens. Now this by itself is already pretty cool. If you wanted to have a shot of somebody running around, make it look like it's first person with a GoPro, that looks great as it is. But what I normally do is I change the lens to something like a, uh, I don't know, like a 30 millimeter. And this looks very similar to what we had before, but now, as you should be able to see, we kind of have some curving in the lens. And now if we draw the line straight up here, you can see that this thing is not going straight up at all. We can actually see the difference here. It's just adding a very slight bend to the camera. Now you can do lens distortions like this in the compositor, but they don't work as well. And I always like to see how things are actually going to look in the viewport in real time. So this is just one of those subtle little things that will make your renders look a lot more realistic. So those were just some of the random little tips that I've had floating around in my head and I haven't been able to include into a video until now. I'm probably going to make some more content like this over on my Patreon in the next few months so you might want to check out the link in the description to see that. While you're down there make sure you also check out the link to Skillshare. Remember the first 500 people that click on that link are going to get a free month trial on Skillshare. Thanks to Skillshare as well for sponsoring this video and making content like this possible. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll catch you later with another video, guys.